flight. Thrilling, fast, dangerous, and sometimes deadly. There are no rules, no limits to the incredible ways we have learned to fly. Man and machine, at one with the sky. In pursuit of the dream of flight, we have seen decades of determination and inventiveness, and witnessed the birth of an amazing number of different and exotic flying machines. There are many different designs and types of power used to stay in the air. Each has its own flying abilities, but they all enable us to defy nature. The Harrier Jump Jet is one of the most extraordinary planes ever built. It can hover in midair and doesn't need a runway. This British design is a helicopter and a high-performance jet all in one. Flying the Harrier is, is awesome. The, uh, the Harrier, to me, is the best aircraft in the Royal Air Force. And because it does so many different things, the Harrier is one of those aircraft where you're constantly saying, well, I think I can do it a bit better. The Harrier cruises at 500 knots. It's one of the world's most maneuverable jets. As a tactical bomber, it has supreme performance on low-level raids. The Harrier's greatest strength is that it can land anywhere. Small landing sites can be set up near the front line, the aircraft hidden in a camouflaged shelter. Ground crews can rearm and refuel in just half an hour. A vertical takeoff would use so much power that the Harrier could not carry a full load of bombs. Using a rolling takeoff, a fully laden Harrier needs only 600 feet of runway. Conventional military jets need up to 9,000. Harrier is built around this single huge engine, the Pegasus, which employs a unique system of nozzles. Four nozzles moving simultaneously. They're pointing backwards. That's normal conventional flight. If we move the nozzles down, we can hover our aircraft by ducting some of the thrust of the engine downwards. When it's hovering, the Harrier's conventional flying surfaces don't control the plane. That's the job for smaller thrust nozzles, called puffer ducts. These are the puffer ducts, four puffer ducts, one on either wing, one on the nose, and one on the tail. Duct some of the thrust from the engine to actually push up or push down, so I can now use my controls in the conventional sense, but I can now maintain a precise hover. The pilot uses his stick to operate both the conventional control surfaces and the puffer ducts at the same time. The Harrier's unique technology makes it one of the hardest planes to fly. Only the very best get the chance to fly it. We take the top guys that come through training 
and then it's our job to get those guys through the Harrier conversion course. Now obviously it's an extremely hard course and unfortunately not everybody can actually make the grade. In training, Harrier pilots use a special two-seater. The student sits in the front. The instructor has dual controls at the back. Okay, Damien, on the, uh, on the takeoff then, we're going to go to 55 log, which will be coming against the uh, stow stock. And when we get ourselves airborne, you're nozzling out, go back into conventional flight, and then we'll uh, do the rest of the after takeoff checks. We put the gear in the flat in the right position. The Harrier is very, very unforgiving if a guy makes a poor error of judgment. If he puts the wrong flap setting when he's on a strip and he tries to get airborne, he will die. Okay, 15 second light, no spouts. Is it really whopper over? The instructor in the back of the aircraft He's working pretty hard to make sure he's matching what the student is doing. We don't want to see a student get a mistake between the throttle and the nozzle. Stage one of vertical flight training. Students repeat to perfection short rolling landings and takeoffs on difficult terrain. The critical point for us is 120 knots to 30 knots. And what we have to try and do is teach a student to get through this area to be able to get to the hover. Learning to hover is the hardest stage of all. When you first start flying the Harrier, when you hover it, it's almost as though you're on a knife edge and you're afraid to move the stick or the throttle in case you fall off that knife edge. It's something that you've never done before. Uh, it's like no other aspect of flying you're doing. The concentration level is about as high as it possibly can be because you know that if you do something wrong, the, the jet is liable to bite you and hit the ground like a brick. It concentrates the mind a heck of a lot. Vertical takeoff and landing aircraft were developed so that planes could take off if their runways were destroyed. During World War II, the German Luftwaffe attached disposable rockets to their planes to reduce takeoff distance. In the 50s and 60s, engineers worked on over 30 different prototypes. Firing planes off the back of trucks, known as zero-length launch, was a surprising success. The problem was they still needed a runway to land. The weird-looking tail sitters were developed with both propellers and jet engines. The transition from vertical flight to normal flight was hard, and landing was nearly impossible. The pilot of this Ryan VertiJet had to literally hook his plane on a stand. In 1954, Rolls-Royce demonstrated a new concept. This prototype became known as the flying bedstead. Vertical flight came from the thrust of two jet engines directed down through adjustable nozzles. The principle was applied to the first British prototype, the short SC-1. This had five small jet engines, four for vertical flight and one for horizontal. But the major breakthrough came with the development of this engine. The Rolls-Royce Pegasus was the first single engine powerful enough to lift a full-size military plane vertically. Today, the Harrier is the ideal warplane for the U.S. Marines. On their amphibious assault ships, four Harriers and 30 choppers use a flight deck less than a quarter the size of an aircraft carrier's. We have no arresting gear or catapult gear, and we just rely on the Harrier's ability to rotate the nozzles on a short takeoff for launch and a vertical landing for recovery. 
The nozzles will be aft at the beginning of the takeoff roll until you hit the end of the ship, where you'll be going somewhere between 90 and 110 knots. As you hit the end of the deck, you will move the nozzle lever down to 55 degrees, and then the airplane will fly away. Using vertical landings, Harriers can operate in far worse conditions than conventional jets. In combat, they provide vital support for the ground troops during amphibious landings. Each assault ship can put thousands of troops ashore by helicopter and landing craft. Ahead of them, the Harriers take out key enemy positions. These are the Thunderbirds. They fly F-16s for the U.S. Air Force. Warrior planes in peacetime pursuits. Extreme machines flown by some of the best aviators in the business. Modern fighter jets fly at twice the speed of sound and corner at 9 Gs, the absolute limit that the human body can withstand. The Thunderbirds perform their breathtaking maneuvers with their wingtips just 18 inches apart. There is no margin for error. The slightest mistake is fatal. Nineteen eighty-eight, an Italian Air Force display team at an air show in Germany. Three jets collide. It's the world's worst air show crash. Death toll 70 people. Fighter pilots are trained to fly themselves and their machines to the limit. In combat, lives are at risk, on the ground and in the air. The dogfight is the ultimate flying challenge. The pilots need skill and raw nerve. In real life, only one will survive. At Sky Warriors, anyone can learn to dogfight in 1950s fighter planes. Even if you've never flown before, you can come here and fly like an ace. So one of the first indications you'll have of a G-force is you'll have start to gray out in your eyes. And the first thing that goes is color. From that point, Today, a policewoman, Donna, is about to do battle with Jeff, a musician. Neither are flyers. They're here to live out their fantasies in the skies. <clears throat> okay, talk a little bit about why you're here. That's dog fighting, okay? Dog fighting is basically a game of angles and energy management. Sky warriors take no chances. The instructors are ex-military air combat veterans. These guys know how to fly. And back is trying to solve angles so he can come right in behind and take a shot. Like a rented <laughs> What we have is a T-34A fighter trainer, fully aerobatic, high-performance airplane. The only difference is we have a laser on board and not the real gun. You know you've been hit because the laser will turn on one of 11 sensors on the airplane and smoke will pour out of your opponent's airplane. So it's as close to reality as you can get. It's a Mark 8 Mod 8 electrically powered uh, optical gun sight, believe it or not, from World War II. Is that right? Yeah. Let's get you adjusted 
in this seat. Well, it's going to be a tough fight. There's egos involved. I'm excited, um, nervous, extremely nervous. Um, going to go up and kick butt. Once clear of the airfield, the instructors hand over the controls. What I'm doing is just holding, uh, basically it's time to fly or die. Uh, you ready to do some flying? Okay. Okay, you got the airplane. You're flying. In the next hour, Donna will graduate from novice pilot to flying ace, executing 4G turns and aerobatic maneuvers. Order. Over like this. See that? Look at that. Donna and Jeff are encouraged to explore the limits of the aircraft. We can see trouble coming in the airplane well before the customer can. And usually when we see them starting to get into trouble, i.e. running into the other airplane or diving too close to the ground, we can intercept that long before it happens. And usually we tell them by voice. And if that doesn't work, then we call it inputs from God. The stick magically moves in the right direction and we make it happen. Roger, here we go. Here, you can fly the airplane in its max performance envelope. You can um, fly it at what we call corner velocity. That is the quickest, tightest turn that allows the airplane to fly at its maximum G right before it stalls. There it is. Come on, baby. He's right there. Hey, look at there. Training over. The fight begins. A dog fight is... Um, it's like two dogs chasing each other in a circle. You get two guys trying to get on each other's tail. It's not about straight forward level speed. Bottom line for dog fighting is you want a, the quickest, tightest turn. Okay, there he is, top of the canopy, we both make good. Now we're just in that high yo type situation if you can get him. Pull the nose up, 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 up. That's it. Whether they're a pilot or non-pilot, here really doesn't make any difference. It's the person that can stay focused and not let their fears overwhelm them. The dogfight demands the planes and pilots are pushed to the limit. Jeff pushes his T-34 too hard. Donna moves in for the kill. It's just so incredible, words can't explain. And to come in here off the street and be able to do it was just really, really wonderful. This was a fantasy, and to do it this way where you really get the feeling of what it was like back there when there's a Zero or a Mr. Schmidt or something on your tail, it's quite an experience. And even though it's lasers and just smoke and it's all fun and games, it's so real when you're up there. It really is. You don't always need a fighter plane to pull extreme maneuvers in the sky. This is the Kri-Kri, the world's smallest twin-engine plane. The Kri-Kri was designed by one of France's top designers, engineers, and as I understand, he designed this in his spare time as a home-built or a kit-built aircraft. And when you add pilot and fuel, it only totals 375 pounds. With its special roof platform, the Cree Cree can be launched almost anywhere. On the runway, or even on the highway, all it needs is a speed of 70 miles per hour for takeoff.
as we accelerate away, I call the speed out. I just give a gentle squeeze on the stick, which allows the nose to rise up and the aircraft then climbs away from the roof. The aircraft cruises at 130 miles per hour. Its top speed is 163 miles per hour. It's capable of doing all aerobatic maneuvers. The aircraft was developed mainly for the sports market. The private flyer could buy the plans or buy a kit, build it in his garage at home and go out and fly what's quite a sporty aircraft. It's very cheap to run. It uses three litres an hour of fuel. About a hundred of the aircraft are now flying throughout the world. This is the age of the home-built plane. Constructed from plans and kits in countless garages and yards, home-builds now outsell manufactured aircraft by 10 to 1. They can often outperform their factory-made counterparts. It's a beautiful day for flying today. I'm sure glad it's not windy like it was yesterday and cold. Ooh. And rainy. Of course, one thing we don't do out here in Texas is we complain when it rains. The last guy I heard of that complained when it rained, they shot him. I have uh, built 11 airplanes, all original design, and then I sold drawings on one of the airplanes, and there were approximately 75 of them flying. And I've always tried to build, uh, you know, light, small, compact, economical airplanes that the average person could afford to fly and build. Home belts have much better performance. You have over 600 kits are plans to choose from, and those start at under $10,000. There's some that are running records of over 400 miles an hour, and you can't get anything like that in a manufactured airplane. The DA-11 is Leon's gift to the backyard flyer, powered by, believe it or not, a lawnmower engine. This is a 20-horsepower lawnmower engine built by Briggs & Stratton. Normally they, they first came out with 18 and now we put a new carburetor on it and it develops 20 now. And uh, that gives us real good performance and real good economy. Doesn't burn hardly any fuel. Incredibly, this all metal plane weighs just 170 pounds. It flies 100 miles to the gallon at 135 miles per hour. We're about to go fly the DA-11, which is quite small, but everything's relative. It flies just like a real airplane. Let's go. The DA-11 gets airborne at 60 miles per hour on just 500 feet of runway. Leon's test pilot, Ken Shugart, is surprised by his performance. It's quite responsive because of its extremely light weight. For its horsepower, it's extremely fast. It's very maneuverable. Basically, I just sit in here and ride. Leon worked as a mechanic in the Air Force and for McDonnell Douglas, but has no formal training in aircraft design. He taught himself. I'm dyslexic. Uh, dyslexics don't do as well with the printed word, and we try to work with our hands, and usually we're quite competitive and you know, we strive to excel in what we do. When I get on an airplane, I work about six days a week, and I work as high as 16 hours a day. Armed with a few simple tools and a few simple rules, Leon's genius is to build planes that easily match the factory-built product. This is my shop where I design and build airplanes. I can do approximately 99% of the work in here. My design tools are a simple calculator and a notebook. And from there, I visualize what the aircraft is going to look like. I work with metal almost exclusively. I would build the windshield out of metal if I could. The worst enemy of an airplane is weight. We have to lift it off the ground. We have to drag it through the air. Power to weight ratio is the most important thing. You can increase the horsepower, which will cost you more, or you can decrease the weight, which doesn't cost you anything. 
Back in 1946, the industry built 35,000 airplanes. In 1996, they built just over 1,100. And this is caused by the fact that the price has just gone up and up and up, and the, they've driven the average person out of the market. And this is where the home build has come in and filled the void. But we have a very important place in aviation because right now we're leading the way. This is the world's most successful home built. It's called the Long Easy. Over 2,000 people have built their own easy planes. This airplane was built uh, in 1988. It made its first flight. It's my own uh, personal airplane that I built at home in the garage. It's uh, since got some 1,300 hours on it in nine years of flying. It's really been a, a very popular airplane. I think the reason it is so popular, it's a great combination of performance and handling characteristics. It breaks all the rules. There's a propeller at the back and a tiny canard wing on the nose. This special wing is designed to prevent stall, the dangerous loss of lift when flying too slowly. It makes the long easy a very safe plane for amateurs. The designer, Bert Rutan, also created one of the most extraordinary flying machines ever built, Voyager. Voyager was built for a single special flight, a non-stop journey around the world without refueling. The particular materials and the manufacturing method that we used for Voyager had to be low cost because we had a very low budget. It was one of the first airplanes that was built entirely out of graphite epoxy structures. In December 1986, Voyager took off from Edwards Air Force Base in California at the start of a historic nine-day flight. The thing that made the Voyager stand out is that 73% of the takeoff weight was fuel. The wings and fuselage were filled with 1,200 gallons of fuel. The two pilots, Rutan's brother Dick and Gina Yeager, were crammed into the tiny cockpit. In smooth air, the Voyager was actually a delight to fly. In turbulence, though, it became a real bear. When it touched down at Edwards 226 hours later, Voyager had flown 27,000 miles non-stop. There were barely 20 gallons of fuel left in its tanks. Its success made Bert Rutan the world's most famous independent aircraft designer. This is his latest creation, the Boomerang. I named the airplane the Boomerang because of the shape of the wing in plan form. It swept forward at the left engine, so it has an asymmetric boomerang with a one longer wing than the other very much like the aboriginal uh, boomerangs. Another radical design with exceptional performance and stability. It's a one of a kind for Rutan's personal use. The Boomerang is the very latest in a long line of prototypes built by a man dedicated to testing the limits of aviation design. He built his Ares fighter just to prove that a high-performance military jet could be developed cheaply. One of the reasons we've done so many airplanes is that uh, we tend to, to not shy away from projects because of risk. We'll do uh, exciting things. We'll do pure research. We will go out and build an airplane uh, if we think it'll work. Many of the world's most extraordinary planes were built just to see if they would work. In 1979, the Gossamer Albatross flew its way into the record books with an incredible human-powered flight. Cyclist and hang glider pilot Brian Allen produced enough power 
just 0.3 horsepower to cross the English Channel at 11 miles per hour. The huge wingspan was designed to maximize lift with the least possible weight. Its mylar skin, less than a thousandth of an inch thick, gave the Gossamer Albatross a weight of just 55 pounds. The crossing began at dawn in still, calm air. In mid-channel, headwinds cut Alan's speed in half. He was ready to quit. He climbed a few feet and found smoother air. He decided to push on. After two hours and 49 minutes, he finally completed the 22-mile flight, gently touching down on a French beach. Two decades later, design concepts from the Gossamer Albatross inspired another experimental aircraft, NASA's Pathfinder. Unmanned and solar-powered, it flies at altitudes over 70,000 feet. Solar cells covering the entire wing power the propellers. Storage cells allow the Pathfinder to fly through the night. In theory, this machine could fly forever. Angel Falls, Venezuela, the world's tallest waterfall. It's a five-day climb to the top, a heart-stopping 120 miles per hour, 13-second plummet to the bottom. These base jumpers pull their ripcords just seconds before hitting the ground. They risk death to live out their greatest fantasy, to fly like a bird, except these birds don't have wings. If you want to fly a simple wing, try a free surfing board. Descending at terminal velocity, it's the ultimate aerobatic experience. But if you really do want to fly like a bird, then you have to go for something a little more sophisticated. Perfectly designed to harness the elements, the glider is much more than a plane with no engine. Okay, glider off the ground again, tow plane's coming off. Stan McGrew is an experienced instructor pilot. Okay, I think we're high enough to we're gonna release. The glider's engine is the air itself. It uses natural currents to stay airborne, Ridge soaring uses the wind as it hits a mountainside and is deflected up. We're going over the ridge uh, with the hopes that we have enough wind blowing up that ridge that'll give me some useful lift. If the air rises fast enough, the glider will soar. It's down to the pilot's skill to find areas of good lift. The glider's long, narrow wings maximize lift and minimize drag. Even in still air, top gliders only drop one foot for every 50 they fly forward. A skilled pilot can travel hundreds of miles in a day. Okay, here we're going to nose down and get a little airspeed and do a loop right up and over the top.
Oh, upside down and down the other way. Now we'll try a hammerhead stall to the right. Up, oops. And fall through like a hammer. Now one the other way. And up we go. And upside down and over the top. Utah manufacturer Dick Cheney has developed a new type of glider. The super floater combines the performance of a glider with the open flying thrills of a hang glider. The enjoyable part of flying the super floater, which is an ultralight sailplane, is that you're out in the airstream, you can see the air, the wind is flowing in my face. It's a really exciting experience. The reason I enjoy flying the super floater is because of its slow speeds. And you're out in the open, it has quite a bit of maneuverability, just like a regular sailplane, except everything happens slower. I've released trying to find some of that lift that we were just in. Just kind of circle around here for a few minutes. Generally fly around 27 miles an hour. A little bit of a steep turn here. The super floater is ideal for thermal soaring. The pilot gets lift by flying tight circles within columns of rising hot air. I can see a hawk down there underneath me. It seems to be looking for some lift. Maybe I can follow him. Well, I've lost the hawk. I can't see him anymore. They're smarter than I am anyway. Next to hang gliding, it's the most exposed flying available today. This glider will appeal to older hang glider pilots who have bad backs and wore out knees. I'm very comfortable. This is Point of the Mountain, Utah, one of the world's greatest natural sites for hang gliding and paragliding. It's a mecca for flyers from all over the world. Light winds are perfect for paragliding. The paraglider is a flexible, inflatable wing. The world's slowest aircraft. It cruises at 15 miles per hour. Flight is controlled by deforming the wing. Pilots make turns by pulling on lines attached to each side of the paraglider. The hang glider is much more of a plane, stiffer, faster, and more versatile. A hang glider is fundamentally an airplane wing with all the rest of the airplane removed and just a triangular control frame that allows us to hang from the center of the wing and control the glider by shifting our weight instead of ailerons like an airplane.
John Heine has designed his own aerobatic hang glider, the Predator. Predator, we've designed to be of optimum performance for cross-country racing and freestyle. And the shape of the wing out in the tip area is the main thing that allows the uh, higher speed and better glide angle. Uh, the Predator will accelerate from minimum speed to 80 miles an hour in less than five seconds, and uh, which is just what you need, for example, for doing a loop. A hang glider wing needs about 20 miles per hour of air flowing past it in order to generate the lift to be able to carry your body. Here's how you turn a hang glider. If you want to turn left, you need to shift your body weight to the left, like this. And then in order to roll out of that turn, you need to shift your body weight to the right in order to level out. To speed up, you pull your body weight forward. You go faster, you slow down, you let your body weight back. In the hands of an expert, a hang glider can soar as high as 20,000 feet, as high as a commercial jet. Okay, we have found ourselves a thermal, so that's why we're making these turns. Two thousand feet up, John Heine practices his freestyle technique. I'm a hang gliding freestyler. It's something that very few pilots pursue it to the advanced levels, and partly because it's not really that safe of a thing to do with a hang glider. In aerobatics, John pushes his hang glider to up to 4 G's acceleration. They obviously handle the G loading and a little bit more of what we do in freestyle, but in general, you'd like a craft to be at least twice as strong as what you'd expect to use. We fly them 80 and 90 to do loops. That's, of course, well above the recommended maximum speed for the hang gliders, so you have to be careful because you can overstress the glider quite easily. To perform loops, John pulls cords to tighten his Predator's wing structure. Well, in order to do a loop, you pull the VG on to tighten the wing up and make it as stiff as possible so it uh, goes the fastest. You haul the bar in as fast as you can and get your body as far forward of the control bar as possible, and that gets your nose in a steep dive. You have to judge the speed you're going by the sound of the wind. At the point where you have the speed, you start to ease the bar out. Momentum carries John through the top of the loop. John Heine holds the world record for consecutive loops in a hang glider. In 1988, I decided to see how many loops I could do. I got somebody to take me up in a hot air balloon to about 9,000 feet above the ground, and I released and started looping. Glider away. When I was about 400 feet off the ground, I had done 52 consecutive loops. This is the Jetpack, the ultimate personal flying machine. Strap it on and take off. Developed by Bell in the 50s, the original jetpack was made for the military, for soldiers to cross minefields, rivers, and other obstacles. It could fly at 60 miles an hour with spectacular agility.
but with a flight time of only 20 seconds, this was an idea that did not really take off. Today it has evolved into the rocket belt, star of stage and screen. When I roll on this throttle, there's an enormous amount of power that takes place behind me. The way we get to this is the two outer tanks are hold our rocket fuel, hydrogen peroxide. It's pushed through this fuel line into this motor where an enormous reaction takes place. It's turning the fuel into superheated steam, which generates about 300 pounds of thrust, equivalent to the horsepower of a Formula One race car. The rocket belt is controlled by these two control arms right here. In my right hand, I have the throttle. When I roll onto it, I lift off the ground. To go forward, I drop my hands down. That takes the thrust tubes and tips them away from me in the back. That pushes me forward. To stop, just the opposite. I pull up, thrust tubes point out in front of me, and that stops me. Once I roll on the throttle, it's just, I get a real gentle, my whole body's just being lifted off the ground. There's not any great force tugging on me, but it's just like somebody just lifting you up off the ground. A slightly more practical, but equally improbable invention was the aero car. Seriously considered in the 50s as the flying version of the family car. What makes I think these aero cars so special is that they're not an experiment. They're actually a, a certified airplane, certified uh, just like a Cessna or a Piper. Only four were built, and this one was lovingly restored to its full glory by owner Ed Sweeney. We go about 200 miles, whether we drive it at 45 miles an hour or we fly it at 90 miles an hour. It goes the same distance with some reserve fuel left in the tank, of course, for landing. Built from aluminum and composites, the Aerocar was a revolutionary piece of engineering in its time. After Sandra and I bought this Aerocar, took it apart and restored it, Ours has become the only one of these four aero cars that is still flying. The controls on the aero car work like this. When you pull it towards you, this gives it up so that it brings the nose of the airplane up. And then, of course, this is a right turn, both driving and flying. There's a left turn. My feet control the rudder. And for driving, this little red flag comes down and locks the control column so that it stops in a neutral position. the aero car that most airplanes cannot do. We're going to stop, we're going to put the transmission in gear, and we're going to back up. It flies like driving a car. It maintains its speed perfectly, it maintains its altitude according to your adjustment of the controls, and we have a lot of fun flying it. The dream of a flying car lives on. In California, the Muller Sky Car began as a single-seat flying saucer.
The designers hope it will evolve into a more sophisticated machine. This concept model for the first working Skycar has five engines. All will be capable of both horizontal and vertical thrust. The Skycar of the 21st century will be controlled by computers and use satellite navigation systems to fly electronic highways across the skies. Today, the original vertical flyer, the Harrier, remains at the forefront of aviation technology. This 30-year-old design has yet to be beaten. But the new millennium is sure to bring many more extraordinary designs. The military needs to keep superiority over the enemy. Civilian designers will find new ways of transporting people. Whether in war or peace, they will continue mankind's quest to conquer the skies.